Elliot Post, and he will be talking about how he introduced GitLab in his DevSecOps journey. So, Tin, please take it away uh, and share your presentation with us. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nitin Sharma. I work for Australia Post. Um, now, before getting started with the, the topic that I'm presenting today, I'm going to quickly touch on uh, DevOps and then DevSecOps. Um, so DevOps is rapid code delivery for me. Yes, I'm going to repeat that again. It's a uh, rapid code delivery for me. Now, before you throw the DevOps handbook at me, I will acknowledge the culture, uh, the cultural automation lean um, measurement and sharing aspects of it. So yes, I, I acknowledge all of that. Um, now, DevSecOps, that would be rapid and secure code delivery for me. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to emphasize that I'm, uh, uh, this basically means that you, it's about bringing security into all different stages of your software development workflow. You're trying to deploy your code or deliver your code as fast as you can, but while making sure that it's being done in a secure fashion. Um, before progressing any further, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I present this today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, this would be the brief agenda that I have put together. Um, I am probably going to go into a little bit of detail. Uh, uh, apart from talking about Australia Post, I will be giving you a brief intro into our organizational structure. Um, in terms of the problem, I will give you a bit more historical background. Uh, while discussing the journey, I'll be talking about different options we evaluated. So there's going to be a few more slides apart from what I'm showing you here. So Australia Post. Now this is the organization I work for, and I'm I'm very proud to be uh, working for them. And uh, there are numerous reasons for that, but I'm just going to give you the facts first of all. So it's a 200-year-old, more than 200-year-old, uh, 280 years specifically, I believe. Uh, it's a self-funded government business enterprise, which is quite a mouthful. Uh, what it basically means is that we are a, an enterprise or a company, but it's completely owned by the government. Uh, I want to mention that uh, Australia Post does not receive anything from government in tax funding, uh, which usually is a news to people who are not much familiar with Australia Post. Um, in terms of what we, how we serve uh, the Australian government, like it's uh, 1.5 billion has been paid in the past decade to Australian government, just in dividends. Um, we have a workforce of uh, more than 75,000 people. I'm sure that number uh, fluctuates and it would have actually gone beyond that. Uh, it's a combination of uh, permanent and uh, contractor uh, employees which are contracting with us. Now, most of you may know us from letters and parcels, but we also do have a massive digital footprint and uh, we provide a range of services for both our customers, so people who are paying, and consumers, people who are consuming uh, our services, such as people just check, uh, tracking their parcels and letters through uh, our websites. Um, now, this is what our organizational structure looks like. I will, um, uh, I will mention a few things here. So I'm part of Platform Engineering Tribe. That sits under the Product Innovation and Engineering umbrella. Um, there are around 300 people in Pi, uh, comprising of engineering, uh, delivery, and uh, business cohorts. In enterprise fold, we have centralized technology functions. Um, so it's similar to what you may have seen across all the other big enterprise. So we have got um, one quick correction here. The auxiliary services here should be, um, that's actually enablement services in our area. So which comprises of central DNS team, account provisioning team, and uh, our cloud services team, which looks after standardization and governance around cloud accounts. 
Um, then, of course, security, like no enterprise uh, can operate without a strong central security function. So we have that in place. We also have uh, strategy and architecture. Um, the other thing I'll quickly touch on, so apart from the software engineering tribes that you are seeing at the top, which are part of Pi, there are a plethora of other software engineering teams uh, which are part of different business units. But for the sake of keeping it all simple, I have pulled them all under the enterprise uh, bucket. Um, now, this would be interesting to um, especially the tech people uh, who, are, uh, who have joined us today. Um, so plethora of technology or tools that are like that shows you what kind of ecosystem we uh, have been operating in. So that's essentially the glimpse of our world. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. Um, however, I will share a few facts with you. So uh, in our business unit, 90% of the developers uh, use this ecosystem to build, test, and deploy their applications in the cloud. Uh, and by cloud, we are quite focused on to utilizing AWS in our business unit at the moment, uh, but that's also changing. Um, the other uh, number that I'll provide you is that uh, last time when we checked, um, it, we were performing using this old um, ecosystem. We were pe performing an average of about 37 non-production and seven production deployments every business day. So that just gives you some baseline. Um, now, in terms of keeping it all simple and focused on to CI/CD because that's where um, the whole introducing GitLab, the why behind it comes into play. I'm just going to quickly move on to the next slide. Um, the one quick thing here, you might be familiar with all the different keywords uh, which are here, or you can always Google for that. But if you're looking at InfraViewer and wondering what exactly is that, so that's an in-house uh, web UI component. Um, think of Asgard or Spinnaker. So, yeah, we are in the process of decommissioning that. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Now, I'm going to pause here on the slide so that you can have a good look at this. Um, so this is basically us defining um, our problem. Um, we, we have been using Atlassian Suite, so a combination of Bamboo, Bitbucket, Crowd, um, for almost like five or six years now. Um, but we came across like a, a, a bunch of issues or uh, I would say areas where we needed a better solution. So highlighting some of these points. Uh, so one of the challenges we have is that currently with Elastic Bamboo, you can only run all of your agents in one account. Um, this has got direct implications for our setup, like the accounting for the cost is actually harder when you when you have multiple teams and but you are running all the different agents in one account and then there are, there are also security constraints uh, which essentially you are now having to run agents which will need cross account uh, access to uh, your other accounts which uh, increases your blast radius then um, pipeline as code Yes, Bamboo has Java specs, but there are much easier way to um, provide that feature. Uh, in terms of support, without being too harsh, I believe Atlassian can actually do better uh, with this support. Um, user interface and development, uh, developer experience has been average. Bamboo has had the similar interface, similar developer workflow for quite some time. Um, so yeah, that definitely needs some improvement. Um, stats were also another major thing for us that every time we have to collect something uh, like how many builds uh, in a month uh, have been built successfully across the whole platform or across a given uh, team. Uh, finding that information out of the box is still quite painful. Um, then the, the other point I'll mention is that cloud native support for self-hosted version of uh, um, Bamboo is still suboptimal. You cannot utilize EKS. You, you can do that, which we are doing that. However, there's a fair amount of work that get, has to be put into that. Then Fargate being utilized for running the agents is also another um, 
thing that uh, is not possible at the moment. Um, then the, the most important, one of the most important things for us is scalability challenges. So you are running Bamboo and Bamboo has got a Bamboo Master. You can only scale that vertically, which can become very costly and you also do not get any redundancy benefits. Um, in our setup, we are running it on EKS, which does provide us fault tolerance. However, the cost can be significant to say the least. Um, moving on to the next point, so it's harder to support compliant workloads. So we have got uh, assets which are PCI and ISM compliant, so payment card industry and uh, information security manual. Um, so it's now by if we were to use Bamboo to deploy these assets, then because of the way Bamboo is set up or because of the, the model uh, essentially that you have to comply with while, while running your Bamboo platform, um, you will essentially have to bring the whole shebang under the compliance scope and which was not what we wanted. So we, we had to look for alternatives. Um, third point that I'll mention here, um, Azure AD integration and other integrations are quite important to us. Um, so that was also a reason uh, we had to kind of look for options. Um, now, some of you may be looking at this and going, but Nitin, there are uh, third party plugins like Mini Orange, uh, which can accommodate that feature. Yes, uh, for people who have been running Bamboo for a while, plugins, they will probably know that plugins can be harder to manage, especially as you upgrade your Bamboo install installations. Um, in terms of the journey, so this is where I will uh, touch on what we actually did about the, the problem that I have just mentioned. Uh, before that, a bit more context. So um, reiterating that our tooling was put together five, six years back. Uh, it did an amazing job for what it was conceived. Um, however, there was no active investment which was made to reevaluate the needs of our developers um, and also to look at the what, what's out there in the market. Um, during this period, our constraints changed, so we had more people deploying more applications. Like when um, our business unit was formed, it was formed with like 50 people or even less than that. The number of applications were less. Um, the other very significant change that happened is um, that our, our strategy changed. We, we started talking about multi-account in the AWS worse, if I may use that. Uh, and then we also talk, started talking about multi-cloud. So we are looking at other vendors, um, GCP and Azure being one, the, the other two. Um, the other important aspect was that we wanted um, same developer experience. We wanted a developer who is working on non-compliant workloads and compliant workloads to be able to deploy their applications in a similar fashion. So we wanted to be able to support both uh, types of workloads using a single platform. Um, now, in, in terms of confirming the cause, there are a few ways um, how we could have gone about it, and I will, I will touch on what we did. So initially we did a few internal uh, exercises to evaluate if we can actually find the root cause, if we can confirm that, and if we can look at some alternatives. Um, we did come up with some data points, but this is where we needed some assistance or we needed a fresh pair of eyes. And hence we decided to bring in mental group to assist us with the discovery work and to come up with a recommendation and a plan. Now, some of you may be um, like listening to this and wondering uh, if we do not, uh, like, do we feel that we couldn't have done this ourselves? Um, I, I believe we could have, but I have got a few whys that I would like to share with you. So when you are too close to the problem, you may make assumptions for what your customers require rather than seeing um, in detail um, as to what they require through an interview process. Um, then also, if you if you interview your customers, your customers, because they know you and they may be biased for the lack of a better word, um, you may not get all the data which uh, a third party may receive. Um, and last but not the least, if your stakeholders or customers um, they may not necessarily view your recommendation as an unbiased 
uh, recommendation, uh, which will affect the adoption. So if you have taken, if you've done all the right things and if for some reason, and you have taken them on the journey, and they're still, uh, because you're sit sitting so close to the problem, so for all these reasons and uh, funding reasons as well, we decided to augment our capacity by bringing mental group in. Um, the one other important point I will um, share here is that trying to get the funding, especially if you work for an enterprise, trying to get the funding is an important part of the job. I, I know it, there's a, uh, there can be a fair amount of bureaucracy, but um, trying to get funding without a plan is not a plan. So my strong suggestion for those working in an enterprise, uh, business cases are important and collaborate with your finance people to get to better translate the tech language to what they will require so that they can actually uh, get you the required funding. Um, so getting the buy-in is what I've basically talked about. Um, I cannot emphasize enough on the communication component. As soon as you, you start the discovery phase, you have to consistently communicate with your stakeholders. You have to take them on the journey. So basically we ran work group meetings, uh, working group meetings. We ran leadership uh, team updates. We wanted to ensure that people at all different levels actually understand and they feel that they're part of this journey. We uh, provided iteration updates to discuss the progress, risks, and dependencies with all of our stakeholders. So people need to feel that they are uh, they are on in this uh, on this journey with you. Um, then I will uh, quickly touch on the options, uh, which is so during the discovery um, phase, uh, which uh, Mental Group assisted us. There were 30 options which were evaluated. There was a massive matrix in which uh, all the different features that we require, they were evaluated. Um, and out of that, we had 40, uh, 14 shortlisted options. Out of that, four or five options were quite closely evaluated. Um, so you may be wondering, what about the SaaS offering? So yes, SaaS offerings such as AWS Code Build, Code Pipeline, along with other options which are partially SaaS, for example, build guide, they were all compared. Uh, we, we quite quickly consolidated our view of what we require to be successful in this space. So um, some of those uh, points I mentioned here, so we needed a unified view of the pipelines. So those who are familiar with code build and other um, similar SaaS offerings, they, they know that if you, you Code build and code pipeline, they're pretty good, but then you have to, you don't get a single pane, uh, single unified view of your pipelines. Then integration was a very important component for us. So zero AD, check marks, um, all of those uh, uh, things that we quite, um, we use on, they, they are mandatory at this point essentially for us. Um, then hosting the code base within Australian um, boundaries was also, it's a legislative requirement for us high availability and scalable solution. That's also, that goes without saying, like when, especially when you are uh, working with roughly 200 to 300 people, uh, every single day during which your platform is inaccessible, you can simply calculate the cost by putting, um, let's say thousand bucks a day for 200 developers, like you're losing a 200 grand a day. Um, now, relevant security and compliance controls. So GitLab, certainly the solution, uh, does have a better security and compliance model, which is more compatible with our needs. Um, this is also another, um, so, uh, comparing the self-hosted versus SaaS offering. So this is where we, um, we evaluated uh, how much of an effort would go into running this platform ourselves versus what we will be getting if we were to get SaaS or what we'll be missing out on. So this is just a quick um, overview of that. Um, now in terms of the solution, uh, so that's our present essentially. Um, we decided to settle on self-managed version of GitLab as our solution. Uh, we did put in enough rigor. We spoke to GitLab beforehand. We spoke to different vendors to kind of ensure that we are actually going to get the necessary support, not just while we are, while we will be bringing in the solution, but throughout the life cycle of that. Um, now, this migration, um, so these four points that I have mentioned here, they, uh, 
that's those are there to share with you what we are doing now with GitLab. So we are in the process of the platform got set up. We had to go through a bunch of exercises to get the evaluation done, to get compliance assessment done. After that, now we are in the process of getting our developers to move their pipelines from Bamboo, their pipelines as well as their code from Bamboo and Bitbucket to GitLab. Our security posture for sure has improved. Um, so things such as code signing, integration with check marks, um, SNCC, uh, and the fact that tenant runners uh, now have a limited radius. So if, if something was to go wrong, uh, the radius is only limited to the, the account itself. Um, the other good thing that came out of this is that now we initially went for, uh, we initially started this journey with the thought process, we're gonna solve this problem for our business unit. However, it seems like this has this is being adopted as the enterprise platform. So more and more teams outside our uh, business unit are coming uh, on board GitLab um, to essentially utilize the features and uh, that we are providing. The fourth component that we are focusing on is uh, essentially education and support. So there are a lot of internal presentations being done in which we are talking about, um, of course, the journey and also what we what needs to be done to move people away from their existing CI CD solutions onto this uh, one enterprise platform. Um, the other two points that I'll quickly touch on. So, and some of you may be looking at this and going, Nitin, why is there a, not a high level uh, diagram or an architectural diagram that you, uh, you could have shared? Well, I'm, I'm preserving that for the next presentation, hopefully. Um, so I wanted to keep it quite high level. Um, so this one, uh, moving back to my second point, so setup is uh, the setup that we have got is essentially running on AWS EKS, so Elastic Kubernetes Service, um, which allows us uh, high availability configuration. Mostly, I will explain uh, by the, the mostly component later. So we're also utilizing EKS-based runners in AWS, and we have also experimented with Fargate and EC2 runners. Um, some of you who may be looking at uh, me mentioning EKS twice here may be wondering that, Nathan, if you're going to deploy EKS in so many different accounts, your cost base is going to go shoot um, through the roof. Uh, you are right. So at the moment, we are evaluating uh, the best ways of making sure that we are getting that high availability and we are getting the, the speed of uh, at, at which our developers expect our builds to run. But at the same time, we, we also have to come up with the balance strategy so that we are not paying AWS too much for the EKS cost. Um, in terms of the future now, um, so GitLab runners, we, um, as I mentioned, that we are going with the multi-account approach. So there is an overhead of deploying runners uh, in new accounts and then maintaining them. We are working towards reducing that maintenance uh, overhead and also the AWS resource cost. Multi-cloud. Um, our business unit is primarily focused on to utilizing AWS, however, uh, our stakeholders, our customers rather, uh, they from uh, from the enterprise, they have started using GCP uh, as an example. So we are looking at options to ensure that our developers do not have to make too many changes to their pipelines if they were to move between different cloud providers. So this is where um, we are, we're still having internal discussion about how to kind of uh, uh, see through th that we come up with a solution for that problem. Now, I mentioned uh, us running uh, GitLab in high availability configuration before. Um, mostly, the only component which is not uh, which is not being run in high availability uh, configuration is GitLab uh, Gitly. So, it's basically uh, we are running it in a fault tolerant configuration. But this is one uh, one area which we would like to improve so that our whole setup is actually, we can we can say that it's actually being run in a high availability configuration. Um, the other important aspect that we are, uh, we'll be assessing, or we are already discussing that, we, but we need to come up with a plan. We want to have CI-CD for CI-CD. 
Now, uh, essentially what we want to do is if we want to maintain our GitLab server, um, we or we want to patch or maintain or upgrade or uh, even orchestrate from ground zero. Then in that case, we want to come up with a combination of, for example, and I'm, uh, the solution could be very different, but a combination of some other service. Um, it could be a combination of AWS code build, code commit, and code pipeline, which then can actually help us set up um, uh, our GitLab platform. Um, I'm going to speed things up because I'm aware that I'm uh, uh, just two minutes left. Um, so takeaways from uh, all of this. So I'll, what I would suggest is that you engineers are passionate about solving problems. So you got to figure out ways of supporting them. You have to listen to uh, where they when they are telling you that this thing is not working or things are painful. And at the same token, you have to provide a top-down support. So that, in our case, fortunately, that all happened. We had really passionate engineers amongst ourselves, and we also had the right leadership support, which actually got us this outcome. The second point I'll quickly touch on is per perfection is equal to procrastination. Don't try to come up with the best possible solution. Think about um, running a tighter scope, especially when you're doing the discovery work. Know your requirements, then reiterate based on the constraints. Uh, communicate with your stakeholders. Um, having a strategy in place is going to help, but what I will suggest is that if you just make an assumption that build and they will come, that might not always fly. Um, context, constraints, and the right tool. Um, know your context, know what kind of budget you're working with, what your legislative requirements are. Your requirements may be very different from us, and you may actually be uh, better off using a SaaS service. So just to be mindful of that. Like also, like think about the right tool for the job. If, you're all, if you do not have the same, um, developer footprint as us, as us, then you need to evaluate your um, requirements from that perspective. Um, fourth is change management, change management and support. Uh, this basically is about sustainable engineering. Take people on the journey instead of trying to rock the boat, if that makes sense. Uh, ask for more, like listen to the requirements of your stakeholders, collaborate with your vendor, ask them for the, ask them for the features. Like ask, so we have got an ongoing conversation with GitLab about the features or bug fixes that we need. A lot of that information we have publicly made accessible, but the, there are a lot of private information that we would discuss with uh, on reoccurring basis with our account manager and solutions architect. Last but not the least, uh, I wanted to say a quick thank you to all the teams which were involved at Australia Post, especially the GitLab project team. And this would not have been possible without their dedication and effort. Uh, and also a shout out to Mental Group and uh, GitLab and of course, Amazon Web Services. Uh, with that, I have run out of time. Uh, so I'm going to give this back to Isaac.